A very good evening to you. Thanks for joining us on the Thursday edition of the show. It promises to be exciting as always. I'm Yemi Adebayo. It's always a delight to have you join us to talk sports right here in London. I must say, you know, Pan Yemi conversations will not stop. After feedback confirmed that Mali will take the place of the D Tigress at the World Cup. Very difficult time for players who have given so much, they build and administrators destroy. Yeah, that's the start story of Nigerian basketball. And of course, we'll be focusing on it tonight as we talk about other things happening in Nigerian sport. Uh, talking about the statement released by FIBA, basketball's uh, global governing body. We'll talk about that as we move on. Tonight on the show, we'll give you a slice of tennis. We'll also, uh, table tennis, the meteoric rise of table tennis in Nigeria. We'll talk about that. We have a report prepared. As the Super Eagles prepare for their second game, under coach Doze Pizarro will look at some of the things happening in the camp and the things that the coach hopes to achieve with the friendlies. We will also talk about the French Open. We have the final two for the women and of course the final two for the guys will be decided tomorrow when the semis take place. Of course a lot of people looking at what will happen between Rafa Nadal and Alexander Zverev. It's going to be very interesting to see Kasper Ruud and Mar Mar Marin Cilic also will play in the other one. Today, of course, uh, Coco Golf made history getting into the final. Of course, we'll also talk about the activities of the sports ministry uh, doing some things. We'll be my such light on some of the things they're doing to let our viewers know what's going on with the sports ministry. That's the outlook of the show today. Let me quickly introduce our partner in the Lagos studio. He joins us this lovely Thursday evening, Bolu Amani. He joins us now. Bolu, greetings to you. Thanks for finding out time to be with us on the show tonight. Yeah, good to be here again on this lovely Thursday evening. Uh, we are looking forward to seeing the Super Eagles play their second game. I tell people, it's always good to win any game, but in friendlies beyond the winning, I saw something different in the Mexico game, at least for the first time in a long time. We saw different formations mm -hmm. in different halves of the game. Interesting, it was when the home base players came in that like we saw it change in the game. Now they'll be playing their second. They'll be talking tough. We've not won a friendly since March 2019, the um, Paul or So hopefully you can pick all three points there. We saw drama, terrible scenes at the um, Lake Salami Stadium yesterday. And uh, I, some person said, let's probably just reset our spots from zero. Let's move away. And um, like you said, and Austin, the, the unfortunate story with the Tigress. Um, the ladies, I remember at the point said they were not going to play due to unpaid monies, but maybe they were persuaded or they changed their mind. They decided to play. They did well, qualified. Unfortunately, they will be under. And don't forget, they won't be able to defend their tripeat as well. So any chance of winning four straight titles is never going to happen, not now. All right, we get to that point where we talk about um, basketball. Let's start the show differently. Uh, so do, let's, let's not hang our heads and, you know, be despondent and be in despair. Let's start with table tennis, the military rise of table tennis in Nigeria. Uh, the steady rise in table tennis in Nigeria comes under focus after the country stage three international competitions next uh, last month. All right, so uh, we have a report put together on this to take a look at what is actually happening and why the game is getting prominence uh, among the young ones in Nigeria and why it appears like it's just going up. All right, so we viewed our report. We'll come back for more of Sports Tonight. Rebel Stars of Nigeria playing against GTTA of Ghana. Nigeria becomes a hub of table tennis in Africa after Lagos hosted three major tournaments. The tournament's targed 2022 Festival of Table Tennis comprises ITTF Western Region Qualification, ITTF Africa Interclub Championships, and the ITTF Africa Cup. The rising profile of the game in the country points to the performance of its players and the election of its administrators to critical decision-making roles on the global scene. Quadri Aruna moves from number 30 in the world ranking in 2014 
to number 10 in 2022, making him the first Nigerian and African to attain such height. So when we say top 10, I don't like number 10. I want single figures. I think Arunov can do it. Top 6, top 7 in the world. He has the ability. He's playing in that area now. It's, but it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot. It's the saddest part about him being in the top 10 is that Apart from one or two people helping out, companies helping out, there's no sponsorship from Nigeria. Former president of the Nigeria Table Tennis Federation, Enito Oshudi, emerges the deputy president of the Continental Body and the vice president of the World Body within a year. Being on the board of the ITTF can only be a plus, you know, for Nigeria. And as you see, we three major tournaments back to back. Next year, we're looking. Of course, the World Tour back to Lagos, uh, star contender, that's the second highest level. And the only reason we're staying at star contender is because of our infrastructure. We don't have to, you know, to contain loads and loads of players. So, for us, it's been a big plus. At the Africa level, seven, eight Nigerians in different committees on the board. We still have, of course, Mr. Banjo Oladapo on the board of directors. So, we're, we're, I think we're doing, we're doing well. But there's always room, you know, as I always to say, always big room for improvement. These attract greater expectations from table tennis enthusiasts as sustaining the gains of the achievements become paramount. We, we have had someone there before. And uh, if you look at them, we don't have a lot of competitions. But now we have competitions that are compacted together. And, uh, this saves money, saves time, saves a lot of things. So countries can participate. And then people will know that if you have somebody at a high ranking there, definitely the person is not there by himself. He was there and he's still there because people wanted for him. They cast their vote and they offer the name of him and he's delivered. So what I believe is that he being at the high sit there in, in, in the world, it is, I mean, you cannot quantify what you should be expecting from someone that is so passionate about the things I've known him for maybe 20 years. He's so passionate and he's still passionate about it. I, I just hope that our players will take advantage. Number one, the players need to take advantage. Number two, the federation needs to latch on it. The federation needs to latch on it. We need to get more Nigerians involved at that level. Maybe not into elected position, maybe even committees for a start. Let them be involved. Let them understand the policies at that highest level. And then we can now start making uh, demands of these international bodies for the development of the game. Table tennis in Nigeria possesses immense potential and prospects, but enduring and consistent development programs need to be in place towards making the game popular and proactive. All right, that's it. Uh, our reports uh, showing the steady rise of table tennis in Nigeria. Uh, Austin, I mean, you take a look at our report, it gladdens, gladdens your heart. We've talked about table tennis, the critical stakeholders, how they've not been fighting with themselves, how they've navigated difficult turns, because there are mm. still challenges. Even the federations yeah. that we praise, they are not without their own challenges. But for table tennis, there are good things to report. Uh, and I'm very happy that um, it, it, it might not have, it, it, it may not yet be on the level it was when we were growing up, because when we were growing up, every street corner there was a mm. table, everybody loved football. You could say right. tennis, table tennis really rivaled football back in those days. The gap is, is very huge, but you cannot deny the fact that there's a steady rise. There is, Yemi, and there's no way we can talk about that rise without mentioning any Tom Waido Shodi, you know? Is the leadership is very important. Everything rises and falls on leadership. So when we keep saying that put the right persons into leadership position, in sports administration in Nigeria, people don't understand. For instance, when any Waido Shudi was leaving, he ensured that there was proper transition. Everything he achieved, he, was make, he made sure that whoever is taking over will consolidate on those efforts. Now, look at how table tennis is doing so well. Because we were doing so well administratively, it rubbed off on the players. I remember a report I did in 2013. When Aaron Okwadri was named the ITTF Star Player of the Year, imagine your countryman being named the best table tennis player. Any Tony Shodi 
told me back on the day that that was a challenge for them to do more administratively. He said, Austin, we need to get into the politics of table tennis in Africa and the world. And I said, why? He said, not because of influence, because we need to learn. We need to know what they are doing. And they learned. They didn't just play table tennis just to win. Young talent, young talent started coming up. I remember Aziz Sholan, that's Aziz right there on the screen. He was a little boy when I first covered him. Now a big table tennis star. Look at Esther Oribami. She, she was just about seven when I first covered her. She is a senior player now. Same with Amadi Ome. You can go on and on and on. There's been a transition. So I'm super excited with the development of table tennis in Nigeria because it's a product of deliberate efforts led by passionate individuals who kept away selfish interest and looked after the development of the sport. And that's why we can see it. Arnold Quadri, a Nigerian is ranked number one in the world, in the in number one in Africa and tenth in the world. Yeah, I mean, let me tell you, when we were growing up, we knew Atonda Musa, and Atonda Ad 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 Musa name reigned for a long time. We were saying, when are we going to get a big name? Shagun Toriola came up. After Shagun Toriola, we're now talking about Aaron Quadri. And when the time of Shagun Toriola, we still had very good players, sound players. So it tells you that these guys know what they're doing. And with the structures they have in place, it will keep getting better and better. The major problem is infrastructure. Had he mentioned it? So the ministry should find a way okay, through partnerships. Say, table tennis is doing so well, has won a lot. So private um, organizations and individuals can come in and make sure that infrastructure is no longer a problem. All right. Uh, so that's it. Let, let, let's before we come to you for, uh, I mean, the issues of basketball because my tongue is tied. I don't want to say anything. But <laughs> Bolu, your thoughts. You look at that report, and I'm very sure you are in agreement about the rise of table tennis. Um, I, I think the only reason Egypt are uh, now way, way ahead of everybody in Africa is because of Nigeria. And um, he spoke about Eniton Shodi. When in power, he did well. Off power, he did well. I think if we have leaders in many federations who think like this, not that I must be the president. If you are fighting with someone and it's not working, if you have that, you can step down and help behind the scene. And that's what Danny Tonshodi is doing. And when he became vice president, I'm not sure anybody argued it because you felt he legit deserved it. I remember when the table tennis championship was held in Lagos and um, Aaron Okodri won. The governor of the state was sitting down. Danny Tonshodi was sitting. He went to hold Danny Tonshodi because he knew I owe my growth thanks to this man. I wish you can have it everywhere. Look at the Prosperity Club. Look at Bayosa. Who is the sports commissioner for Bayosa? He was an ex-athlete. So, any don't show the show, you don't have to be the greatest athlete to lead well. For Bayosa, he is showing well, I can be a great athlete and also lead. So, first up is the mind. You have to be intentional about the growth and everything. And like Austin said, infrastructure, that's why I feel the ministry should put every possible attention. There are some things that belong to the NOC. Ministry has taken over everything. So if everyone knows their position, if everybody knows their jobs, and everyone should follow through, I think our sport should be great. So well done to table tennis. Remember what ITTF said when they, before they played this um, Africa Cup in Lagos? They said Lagos State has become the capital for table tennis in Africa. That speaks volume. All right. That does speak volumes. All right. Let's address the elephant in the room. Austin, I want to yield the floor uh, to, to you. <laughs> I've read a lot. I've seen a lot. A lot of commentaries, some unprintable words used, and my head is full. So I just passed the baton uh, to you, but we can all agree, not a good day for basketball in Nigeria. Mm. Yeah, I me, mean, your head is full. Mine is fuller. I don't even know how to cover it, but definitely... Not a good day for basketball in Nigeria. Let's let's go back uh, and, let, and refresh the minds of our viewers. On Thursday, the 12th of May, 2022, the federal government of Nigeria announced the immediate withdrawal of the country from international basketball competitions for a period of two years. And we're wondering what's going on. But right there, a major reason that, the, that the, um, the ministry gave was the senseless leadership crisis going on in the Nigeria Basketball Federation. So we showed them on this show, we highlighted the implications of giving yourself a self, uh, giving yourself a ban for a period of two years when 
these ladies were getting ready. And that's the implications right there. Let me refresh uh, the minds of our viewers. We said that the D-Tigress will be withdrawn from the 2022 FIBA Women's World Cup in Australia, which is scheduled to take place from 22nd of September to October the 1st. FIBA has spoken. We'll still tell you. The D-Tigers would be expelled from the African qualifiers for the 2023 FIBA Men's World Cup to be jointly hosted by Japan, Indonesia, and the Philippines. We also told the Federal Minister of Youth and Sports Development and the MBBF that the D-Tigers and the D-Tigress would be barred from the qualifying tournaments for the 2024 Olympic Games that will take place in Paris, France. It's painful. The Day Tigers and Day Tigress would also be barred from future Afro Basket Championship. And Bolu just reminded, reminded us that the Day Tigress, they're on a three pit. They want to break record, win it for the first time. That dream dashed. All Nigerian junior national teams would be barred from FIBA organized competition. Nigerian um, basketball clubs would also be barred from future Basketball Africa League. And the Basketball Africa League is growing and it's one that is good for league development. All Nigerians in FIBA committees will also be expelled. FIBA would suspend Nigeria from all of its activities for government interference. So while they begin to, when, when they decide to have some reasoning, FIBA will say, okay, you've, you've done your own self-imposed ban. This is where we are. But FIBA is talking again. They have sent a letter, and it's a FIBA has been informed about the decision of the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to withdraw, withdraw the basketball team. Now, let's go down to the implications of this long time that was made by FIBA. It means Nigeria's withdrawal from the, 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 the World Cup has been confirmed, and with that, the country will lose its place. But let me just read this letter so you really understand it. FIBA was informed about the decision of the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to withdraw the Nigeria Basketball Federation, MBBF, from all international basketball competitions and activities for a period of two years. In subsequent communications with the MBBF, and despite FIBA's request, it has become clear that against the circumstances created by the government's decision, the MBBF is unable to confirm its participation in the, women, in the FIBA Women's Basketball World Cup for 2022. There's more to that letter, just to let you know that the international community they're watching. Given the multiple strict deadlines that cannot be postponed in order to ensure the successful staging of a major international event, which includes our visa procedures, schedules, ticket sales, accommodations, friendly games, preliminary rosters, flight tickets, accreditation, and so on and so forth, and to protect the integrity of the competition, the FIBA Executive Committee has decided as follows. Praise up, Nigerians. What did FIBA say? Nigeria's withdrawal from the FIBA Women's World Cup 2022 is in it and it's confirmed. Mali, as the next ranked team from Group B of the FIBA Women's Basketball World Cup 2022 qualifying tournament in Belgrade, is invited to participate in the FIBA Women's Basketball World Cup 2022. FIBA will announce whether there will be any other decisions related to the MBBF's participation in other MBBF competitions and any potential disciplinary measures in due course. So I know, Yemi and Bolu, that right after this, FIBA will say, hmm, since, since you want to eat more bans, they will now come hard on Nigeria. So Bolu, it's looking like the situation is getting from bad to worse. Well, um, if there's anything worse than worse, probably would use that word because I remember when the letter came out so weeks ago, we thought, well, there could be a change of heart, change of mind that you are taking the food away from, you have taken the food away from many even in Nigeria. I remember for probably six years now, we don't have the first division league and it's been on and on. Truth is, the excuse of senseless um, leadership tussle it's not legit, it doesn't hold water to me because if that's the reason, why not disband the entire board and everyone and let the players be? Because 
The athletes are not the ones battling for presidency or for leadership. The athletes are not the ones having two factions. The athletes are not the ones selecting one faction. One, the athletes are not the ones who did one election in Benin. They are not the ones who did another election in Abuja. They are not the ones. And truth is, more than the athletes, even some journalists would suffer because some of those things are media officers. They have media teams that they could go around with. Many people would definitely lose a lot in the space of two years, and the two years is just us. Then, what happens after two years? One thing is certain, FIBA will come hard. It is not the first time it's happening, and it would never be the last. We've been escaping some things because we are Nigeria. Yeah. But the truth is, at this stage, I don't think they will look at that Nigerian thing. They mm -hmm. have to hit us very hard. More worries for the Tigers and the Tigers. <laughs> you know what? We need to go on a break. We need to cool off. It's, it's a handful. It's tough. Tough to handle. Let's go on a break. We'll return for more on Sports Tonight. All right, welcome back. Um, if you're just joining us, you, you missed uh, quite a bit. We'll compensate you with the rest of the show. But just to let you know, we were talking about basketball, the rise of table tennis in Nigeria. We've covered a lot of ground. Austin has taken us through uh, the likely implication of this. And we've, we've seen the first part, which is what has happened today. And while on the break, Bolo, Bolo was telling me that when we return to our senses, FIFA, FIFA will now come and say, yeah, this is my verdict. You know, it's, it's a gloomy day. Uh, but we have to move on. There's a lot to talk about on the show tonight. So let's go on and uh, talk about, uh, well, Nigeria's mini Olympics. That's our next sport of call now. Uh, the National Sports Festival, ahead of the National Sports Festival, the Sports Ministry is uh, going around inspecting sports facilities in Delta State, and that's what's been happening for a while. It's no longer news that uh, Delta State will host the next edition of the National Sports Festival. Uh, so uh, the Youth and Sports Development Ministry has gone ahead to commend Delta State on their readiness to host the 2022 National Sports Festival in November. The permanent secretary of the ministry, Ismail Abubakar, also serves as the secretary of the main organizing committee of the National Sports Festival, led a team from the ministry on facilities and inspection tour in Asaba. Uh, Mr. Bubaka says the state of work is done and the facilities visited in the case that the state's uh, government's committed commitment to hosting a befitting national sports festival later in the year. Let's listen to the permanent secretary of the ministry, uh, Ismail Abubaka, bear his mind on what is going on in Delta State. And we'll come back for more on Sports Tonight. You see, the essence of the visit is for us to look at what we have on ground and then take note of where uh, efforts need to be intensified for us to be able to achieve the goals and objectives of hosting the competition here. And like I said, I'm satisfied. We're going to intensify efforts to make sure we round up all our activities for successful hosting on or before September ending. That's what we are looking at. All right, that's it. Um, it's always good to hear uh, when you're told that the host is going to be ready before the deadline. The games is November. And so uh, this takes us to our net port of call, even before I get Bolu's views. When you look at all of this, Nigeria's mini Olympics, it takes us to grassroots, where the real development is needed, Austin. What it is, I mean, you know, that's the base, that's the foundation, that's the heart of development. You know, if you disregard the grassroots, you struggle. In fact, majority of the athletes that you see at the National Sports Festival, we come from the grassroots. And tonight on the show, we'll talk about some of the benefits, the opportunities that you, a country, can enjoy when they pay attention to the grassroots, when you invest. Let's talk about the Prosperity Cup. It's in its fourth edition. Remember, it used to be the, the um, it used to be the, the Transformation Cup, and then it was rebranded into the Prosperity Cup. We told you that scouts from different parts of the world, they are touching down right there in Bielsa to take a look at the talent. 206, Yemi Abolu, 206 communities taking part in the Prosperity Cup. The state government, they took a look and they're like, what's the way we can use to engage the youth? And they said, football. They love to play football. So they went around 
if you can bring youth from 206 communities in, a, in bio system and say, come and play football. Right now, the competition is in the round of 16. The finals will be played June the 26th. But it just tells you that these are some of the ways that we can use to achieve proper sports and youth development. I want to say kudos to the bioassisted uh, government for this Prosperity Cup, for keeping it going. And now scouts are coming to Nigeria. Look at them from France, from Australia, from South Africa. And they're saying, we know we've got talent in Nigeria. So we are here to see ways that we can work with these talents and make sure that we give them a brighter future. Let's listen to... Uh, some of the talking points coming out of this competition is a grassroots competition, remember? I was saying that if you get it right, it will get better. Um, in the past few days, we've had international scouts from um, Europe, and the Americas, and Africa here to look at the outstanding talents we've been able to discover in just uh, two, three weeks of uh, playing soccer in the tournament. This is just the first phase of uh, uh, the series of scouting activities planned to showcase the outstanding talents, brilliant skills of football we have in the state. I first came here in 2010 when I negotiated uh, the contract with the, the NFF for my client Lars Lagerbach, who was a technical advisor uh, to the Super Eagles for the 2010 World Cup campaign in South Africa. Uh, I've also represented Super, Super Eagles players uh, such as Lukman Haruna, the former midfielder, uh, with, with Monaco and Dinamo Kiev. Uh, and I also currently rep uh, represent Ramon Aziz, uh, the former uh, Super Eagles midfielder. I've transferred Puncho Bamik Boy uh, from Nigeria, from the under 17 national team 2015 to Haladash in Hungary and then transferred him to the biggest club in Hungary. Uh, he's, had, he's having a very good career. So I understand Nigerian football very well, have good connections here, and it's been a pleasure to, to be invited to Bayelsa State uh, and to, to look at the talented players here and potentially provide them with some pathways uh, into the professional game in Europe and of course also in other parts of the world. Of course, I'm, I'm an international scout for Sundowns and I'm always looking for players that are better than what we have. And that's what I've I'm, I'm always been doing in traveling around the uh, countries. I have traveled over 35 countries in five years, um, so that's my job. And also to look for something that is better than we have at home. If we've got a better player in Nigeria, then why not to, to recruit the player back to Mamelodi the Sundowns? That's what we're talking about. So if we see better players here and... What's wrong with us taking them to Mamalodi Sundown? So that's why we, we keep saying to the Ministry of Youth and Sports Development, to the NFF, engage your state council, Bolu, the grassroots. Everything happens there. And if we get it right, I think our football will get better. It always seems like instead of, um, of uh, let me say, upgrading the grassroots, we always just find the machetes to cut down mm. the grass. That's why we are still where we are. It's, it shouldn't even be something very difficult. That should be the easiest way to get... Corbin age fraud is something that should be easy. Exploring our grasses should be something easy. But unfortunately, it is the biggest task. It is the most difficult thing we are doing. Every administrator come up with a work with grasses when I'm elected. And, but we still don't see this impact. Look at what Bios are doing now. Mm. Look, he, just look at the caliber of people that came there. This Mamelodi Sonda Malewa said he's been to 35 countries in five years picking out scouts mm. for his team. So why can't we have something like this everywhere? State, most of the time, people hit out at NFF alone. They are not the only ones in this. Even the states as well. There's something you can also do for your state. If NFF are not helping, can't you help yourself? Because in the end, these talents are from your states, not from the NFF. So I think it should be all hands on deck. Not just NFF. Not everybody should do play their part. There's nothing wrong here while the Prosperity Cup is going on in Bayosa, Eco Cup is going on in Lagos, Ibado Games, everywhere, mm -hmm. running simultaneously. Mm -hmm. We will not rest because yeah. these talents are there. And uh, who says we can't win the World Cup, but we need to do the right things? Not just uh, we want to, we can't even qualify for Qatar. So, how do we even think about winning it? No, <sighs> look at the scouts from a, a football club in South Africa, Yemi, saying he has traveled to over 30 countries. Now you can tell why their football gets better. Mm -hmm. He's yeah. not going to those countries to go and look for established talent, young mm -hmm. talent that will, they'll bring to South Africa and train. It is what you saw, you reap. And, and this was a league that some of us were making disparaging yeah. remarks about a few years ago. 
But, but look at what is going going on now. They can conveniently get players from everywhere. They, I mean, they're not talking with their yeah. mouth. They're talking with their actions, and and, and it shows. Yeah. And of course, <laughs> Bolo also said that off camera, we're not serious. Sometimes you look at what is happening, and maybe we should just tell ourselves, can we just forget about these things for the next five years? Because it appears like we're making the same mistakes over and over. over and if over. we are not busy shooting ourselves in the foot, we are damaging things somewhere. We're ensuring the production line is not intact. A, a lot of things going on. And there's enough blame to go around, not just the NFL. Exactly. What about the states? Mm. You know, what about people who claim they love the sports, can't put their money? You know, would rather bring, invest every amount of money, big amounts of money on foreign football and bring it, slam it on our face here in Nigeria. And if you divide the amount of investment to 10, just use it for Nigerian content, they wouldn't do that. They'll just put the money. And you see, like I said, enough blame to go around and... I hope that we're going to be able to pick the pieces and move on. And, and by the way, let's quickly talk about the Super Eagles of Nigeria. Uh, Bolu struck a nerve in me uh, when he talked about we couldn't even qualify for the World Cup. Just when uh, you think you have forgotten that Nigeria will not be in Qatar, somebody reminds you. I mean, it's so I painful. Know, yeah. That I can't yeah. watch Ghana play. Is that bad for me? <laughs> that I just don't yeah. like seeing Ghana because the moment I see them, I remember what they did to the Super Eagles of Nigeria. Be like for this me. Football. Be like me. The only way to forget, make Ghana your team. I've said I'm supporting <laughs> Ghana at the World Cup. You know, well, even today, I had to make a post, put on social media to say I was thinking about this thing again, and it still hurts. It, it does. does. Because the World Cup, it's the Super Eagles. Of Nigeria. Wow. All right. Let's talk about the friendly next game. Second game under coach Jose Pesero is what you have on your screen at the Red Bull Arena in Harrison, Ecuador, and Nigeria. Uh, some have said Ecuador has more stake in this. They're going to the World Cup. They want to see how they can prepare their team. But of course, coach Jose Pesero as well, trying to see some guys who probably may not get the chance uh, to play if the big boys <laughs> come back to town. But but it's good uh, that we are having this. Let's quickly listen to uh, the assistant manager of the team, Finidi George. Uh, of course, share his thoughts with us ahead of this game. We'll come back for more on Sports Tonight. I think um, it's not easy uh, just a week uh, with the players and uh, yeah, he's trying to give them all the information, um, but bit by bit. So I think um, by the time we get to the um, qualification, I think um, the players definitely will know what is expected of them and then um, try to do their best for Nigeria. A different form of training because uh, it's unlike the last game we played. We started with the back three. And uh, I don't think most of the players are familiar with the back three. So we, we opted for the back four, which we changed. And you can see the second half of the game went well. And that's what we're doing. We're working on the, on the defensive, offensive mode and the defensive mode. All right, uh, assistants of Jose Pesero there, Nigerian assistants of Jose Pesero, Fini the George, Ismail Abdallah, both uh, sharing their thoughts on, on the game. But let me just quickly uh, come to you. Um, some have said the criticism must stop. It's our team. We have to get behind them. Uh, but does that mean when we see things that are wrong, it, because we want to encourage the team, you should just... Because a lot of people have yet to get over overloading the coaching crew. It's still an issue to some people. Remember when um, the names of the assistants were mentioned, one of the first things we said was, why do you have assistants when you don't even have a coach? Because most assistants go about with at least two, three of their own crew. So now you already had about five assistant mm -hmm. coaches. Then he I mean, now came he with, his yeah, own. with his own. We have match analysis. He came with match analysis. He came with his fitness coach. So what happened to the ones we have? Are we sending them? Even in the ones we have, we are still changing position. Switch uh, Salisu Yusuf and uh, finish job from first to assist, uh, second, second to first and all. But for those saying criticism should end, ask them if they fail to criticize their football club they support or not. Especially if you're a Manchester United fan. 
even if they are doing well, you see hits at them. So I think it's a norm. We've heard stories of even if you are doing so well, sometimes they tell you you can do better. So mm -hmm. that's why I think it's happening. But as of now, I, I think uh, the, some of the hailings and everything, still early. Because when they are hailing, they are not saying it's still early days. But when you criticize the bit that we still lost the game, uh, it's still early, give him time. I think one of the things I need to make clear first off is, are they looking at five-year plan, 10-year plan? Are we looking at tomorrow? But from the contracts, even though they didn't tell us, it feels like it's just one year. That means, Jose Pesero, you must win the AFCON or maybe get to final or something. So we need to even know the conditions. We need to know what you are telling him. Are you telling him you must win? Are you telling him these guys are young? We place them into your hands. In the next five years, we must do this and that. So these conditions need to be clear. If you don't make them clear, journalists will assume. And when journalists assume, all hell will break loose. So tell us what the truth is in the contract that we can conclude. But for me, I think I just want to enjoy difference. I want us to explore the players we have. I say it all the time. We have one of the best squads in Africa. It doesn't mean we have the best players everywhere. But in terms of African level, we have one of the best squad, if not the best. But we shouldn't be losing in the second round. So hopefully, Ose Pesel will explore. And for those saying maybe I respect, I don't think none of these players in our squad is as big as the players who say Pedro as coach, at least in Real Madrid as assistant coach, All has right. worked with the Zidane Zako. So hopefully we'll be able to explore the talents we have in the team. All right, hopefully we'll be able to explore the talents we have in the team. I know Austin wants to say 18 or two, so Austin, the floor is yours before we go to the French Open. There's a lot to cover on the French Open, but then again, your thoughts on the Super Eagles. I just want to see them, you know, come out against Ecuador and be daring. I want to see them move beyond what, uh, what happened with missing out of the World Cup. We saw some brilliant play against uh, Mexico. Uh, let's see them get better against Ecuador. Uh, a lot of fans have complained about the style of play. They've said that the ball doesn't move you know, the way it should move. They've said that they've not seen hunger. They've not seen desire. I just want to see all of those things. I know it's a friendly game, but... Yeah, me, Bolu, you guys know Nigerian football fans. They always want their darling Super Eagles to win. So it will be a very terrible start if Pizarro records losses in his first and second game in charge of the Super Eagles. And you're already telling people that you want to win the AFCON. <laughs> so that will put more pressure on him and the team. So <laughs> this game against Ecuador, yeah. whether or not they see it as a friendly, it yeah. is one that even if they lose, the, the manner in which they lose is very important. If my end 2-1, I would say, hmm, hmm, mm -hmm. that's okay, that's okay. My end 2-2, two, two, we say, hmm, we'll take it. If they win, they'll say, fair enough. But if you lose... Your first two matches? Well, you know the rest. I, of course, of course. <laughs> All right, let's move on on the show, guys. Let's take two results from the AFCON uh, qualifiers. I, I mean, today, I, I mean, some of, the, some of the rules you hear, teams that will be at the World Cup, some of their own qualifiers will be staggered in a way. And when you read all those things, it hurts. Uh, for those who are not going to the World Cup, they play at the normal time. Those who will be at the World Cup. But let's take a few results of matches played today. There is it on your screen in Group L, Mozambique and Rwanda, a one-all draw. Uh, and of course, Tunisia and uh, Equatorial Guinea. That's the result that you have on your screen. It's live currently going on as we speak. The Cartage Eagles are leading by it go. All right, on that note, we have to wrap this up on the show. It was fun uh, doing this, but unfortunately, as it always is, time not our friend on the show. All right, Bolo Amoni, I want to thank you for today. Hopefully, we'll do this again some other time. It was a pleasure. All right, that's the show today. We do hope that you've enjoyed everything we've been able to bring to you. We'll be back here again uh, tomorrow from the city of Lagos, right here in Nigeria. I'm Yemi Hadibaya saying bye bye now. Yes, we'll be back again tomorrow. Keep the conversation going on Twitter channels underscore sports. In London, I must see Nukonakman. In everything you do, remember, keep talking sports. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.